Thank you very much, Tony, and thanks for inviting me to, to come and give this talk. Yeah, so at least in the last couple of years, I've been trying to work a bit on some questions in learning theory, and this is, this is one of them, which is done work with my postdoc, Martin, uh, which and was accepted here in New Rips 22. So just a very gentle introduction, just very, very basic first. So we're looking at supervised learning, in particular, we look at binary classification problems, where I guess there's some input, for instance, images, and uh, then you want to use and you also know what's on these images. They have labels, all of them, these examples. For instance, either it's a picture of a cat or a croissant. And you want to take this training data of images and corresponding labels. And then from it, you want to uh, use it to make predictions of new data, right? You want to, uh, for instance, given a new picture where you don't know what the label is, you want to use the training data to somehow predict whether this is a picture for a cat or a croissant in this case, right? So if we're looking at binary classification, there's only two possible classes. and um, if we want to do it a little bit more formally, we assume in general that the data comes from some input domain X, for instance, all these 724 by 724 pixel images, and the data have labels from some domain Y, and here we think of uh, binary classification, so let's just think of the labels as minus one and one, right, so this is the most classic uh, use of them, and then what we're trying to learn is some unknown target function that um, takes any input in the input domain and maps it to a label. So once you think of this as this correct mapping of images to cat uh, or in this example. And generally, this is the function we're trying to learn. And here, we keep it simple. That's a deterministic function. So for every input element, there's a unique label that we're trying to learn, right? There are also models where maybe the, the label can still be uh, random after seeing the, the input element, but maybe there's a distribution over possible labels. How do you pick cat and croissant? <laughs> I don't remember. It was someone at the department that had done something similar. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So, what we have for this uh, learning problem is, of course, the training data consisting of these labeled examples, M examples in general, where we have the input element xi and the corresponding label f of xi. And this is what we have uh, to, to use in order to output some hypothesis that on a given x uh, outputs a label y and we'd like that this hypothesis is as close as possible to, to this unknown target function. Right? And I guess there's several ways we can try to define what it means that the, this hypothesis is close to the unknown target function f. Right? So what we'll look at here, okay, so maybe it's just a formal picture, right? So we have the unknown target function, we receive these training samples, elements in the corresponding evaluation of the unknown target function, we feed it into a learning algorithm, the learning algorithm outputs a hypothesis. So this could be uh, right the mapping of images to cat croissant, the training samples of these labeled images. And we want to find, in general, the learning algorithms typically try to find a hypothesis that often gets the label correct on the training data, right? Because we have all the labels on the training data available. So we can try and we can just look and see how many uh, it gets the label correct on. And of course, the question is, what is the hypothesis set? And what do we really mean by H being close to to the unknown type function f, right? So maybe let's have one look at a kind of hypothesis set that could make sense. For instance, it could be linear models. So binary classification, we could assume that the input domain is uh, d dimensional vectors. Every point is specified by, every training example is specified by d numeric values. And then the hypothesis set could be all hyperplanes so that everything on one side of the hyperplane, you return plus one, and everything on the other side, you return minus one, right? So this could be the hypothesis at all such hyperplanes. And now we're going to try to formalize a little bit what we mean by this H being close to the unknown type function F. And here we're going to look at packed learning, standing for probably approximately correct. And here, uh, in general, I just specifies what we mean by this. It also says something about uh, new data that we want to make predictions on is somehow similar to the training data that we uh, have available for uh, computing the hypothesis H. Right? So here we also add a data distribution. So there's an in unknown distribution D over this input domain. And now the training data consists of these MIID samples where each of these XIs is drawn from this unknown distribution. And we see this XI and the label F of XI. And so this is how we assume that the data for training was generated. Okay. And now uh, what we mean by this new data that we're going to make predictions on is similar to the training data. We mean that uh, we also get an example where this XI is drawn from the same distribution D independently of the training data. When we have these, we can actually try and prove something about uh, the quality of this hypothesis H. In particular, we would like to try and prove that this hypothesis that our learning algorithm produces from the training data, it's often the case that 
yeah, the error under this distribution D, so the chance of mispredicting a new element drawn from distribution D, we want this to be as small as possible, right? So this is just, we get an independent sample from the distribution D, we're looking at the probability that H gets the label uh, wrong for this X. Okay. So, right, so I guess this picture is augmented with this input distribution, right, that generates the XIs over here. And it also generates this X that we're going to evaluate the unknown hypothesis on, or the, or the, the new hypothesis on. And the goal is that we want this, the error under D to be as close to zero as, as possible in general. Okay. So there's several models we can look at this pack learning in. And I guess the simplest one is in this so-called realizable setting. So here, what we assume is that this unknown target function f that we're trying to learn actually lies in this hypothesis set that we're also outputting from. So for instance, if this h was the linear models, right, we assume that the unknown target function is actually a hyperplane and every uh, x that lies on one side of the hyperplane has to label plus one, and every x on the other side has to label minus one. Okay. And I guess this implies a couple of things. And one of them is that if I get a training data set s, I get always find a hypothesis that gets all the labels correct right because in particular the unknown target function is in the hypothesis set and that one gets everything correct the problem is just there can be multiple different hyperplanes that get everything correct in, in this case here right so uh, even though i output something that gets all the training data correct it's not clear that it's going to get uh, new data items correct all the time okay Right, so this could be the H, right? You'll find an H that gets all the training data grades. It looks almost like the unknown target function F, but it's a little bit different, right? So there might be some examples where it'll mispredict the label. Right, so it looks something like this. Okay. And I guess the classic learning theory results all the way, the way back from the 80s it says something about what we can expect in this case. So let's try to see there are a couple of parameters here. So I guess we'll go over them slowly. So one of them is say, okay, let's say I want to output a hypothesis whose performance on the D has error at most epsilon, error probability at most epsilon. Then it says here, how many samples do I need from this unknown distribution before with probability one minus delta over the sample, the hy every hypothesis that gets all the labels correct has a small error on the D. Right? So, so what it's trying to say is if, uh, if I have enough samples, then all I need to do is to find any hypothesis that gets all the training labels correctly, because if I output it, its error is going to be small under the distribution D. Right? And in general, this one minus delta, I guess that counts for being unlucky of getting an, a training data set that's not really representable. Maybe you send the same example all the time or something like this, right? So, uh, so this, this, I guess, is the, the probably in approximately correct. Right? So, but overall, I guess the dependency is like one or epsilon here in the number of samples. There's a D here that I didn't say what it is, but this is the VC dimension of the hypothesis set. I just remind you on the next slide what it is if you forgot. And I guess then it has this logarithmic dependency on epsilon and a logarithmic dependency on, on uh, one over delta. Okay. But in general, it's just telling us if I, no matter what the data distribution is, if I have enough samples, then any hypothesis that gets all the labels correct also has a good performance on this data. And I guess the, this general algorithm of just finding some hypothesis that gets the labels correct and outputting that one is called empirical risk minimization. So the most natural learning algorithm you could think of here. Okay. And there's also a matching lower bound, basically oops, showing that this is the right number of uh, samples to get such a guarantee, right? You cannot really hope to. Uh, there are data distributions where you need this many uh, samples to, to have this property. So by uh, matching, you mean like even for epsilon? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, there's a constant, up to a constant factor here in the, yeah, then it's the, the right number of samples, They're both in the delta dependency and the epsilon and the D dependency. Yeah. Okay. Okay, just VC dimension, if you forgot, uh, right, the VC dimension of a hypothesis at H is the D such that there is a set of D samples that can be shattered and no set of D plus one samples can be shattered. And what is shattering, right, it is if I have D samples, so D elements from the input domain X, then I can shatter it if I can generate all the two to the D possible labels, right? They have this binary, so there's two to the D choices for the assignment of labels. And if I can generate all of them, then I can shatter it if there's some hypothesis for every label. In general, right, that's just a simple example. If we say our data, yeah, I guess one dimensional feature vectors, so they don't have one 
um, and everybody describing them. And let's say the model is hyperplane. So I guess a hyperplane in 1D is just a, a point, and then everything on one side is, is the plus class, and everything on the other side is the minus class. So, so with these hypotheses, right, uh, we can check that we, there actually does exist two samples that we can shatter, right? So we look at two samples here with distinct coordinates. We want to check that we can generate all four possible labelings. And it's not too hard to see that there's a hyperplane that for every one of those labelings. So we can shatter two. And we can also check that it's not possible to sh shatter three points. So if I have three points, I could order them on the line. And then this uh, labeling here with, like, I guess, red on the two outermost ones and blue in the middle one, it's not possible to generate with any hyperplane. All right, so there's no set of three points that can be shattered, but I can shatter two points. So the VC dimension here is, is two. And in general, for hyperplanes in D dimensions, right, the VC dimension is D plus one. Okay, and the sample complexity before depended on this VC dimension of the thing we're trying to learn. Okay. Okay, but then it's not always the case that um, maybe the data, the unknown type function is line H, right? So maybe if, you're, if this is your data, there's no hyperplane in this case that perfectly separates this data, right? So, so what can you do in, in settings where the unknown type function does not lie in this hypothesis set that your algorithm is outputting from, right? And there are several different ways of approaching it. One of them is packling in the agnostic case. I'll just say there's a few words about it. Uh, so here again, that's the unknown type function, but it's not necessarily in this hypothesis set that you're outputting from. So what you're hoping to do in, in this case is instead to say, Okay, so in my hypothesis set, there's some hypothesis that has the best performance among all of them, right? The one with the smallest error on the D. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to find something that's almost as good, right? So I want to output a hypothesis that is basically as close to this H star as, as I possibly can, right? So the difference in the error on the D is at most epsilon, right? So this is pegging in the agnostic case and has also been studied a lot. Um, but this is not what we're going to look at in this talk. Uh, maybe one issue is that well, maybe there's no hypothesis in there that does very well, so, so maybe this is not so interesting in, in some examples, right? In particular, this kind of data out there, it's not, I guess we wouldn't want to settle for using a, a linear model for this type of data. Right. So, so there's also, so what else can one do? I think the last kind of classic approach to, to handling this is what's called weak to strong learning. So, so to say, like briefly, a weak learner is something, is a classifier that's a little bit better than guessing. Uh, when it needs to predict labels, right? So in some sense, right over here, this one is it's definitely not perfect, but it gets more than 50% of the data correct, right? So it's a little bit better than guessing. This is kind of the idea of a weak learner. It does a little bit better than guessing. I'll give a formal definition in just a, a second. And generally, a strong learner is a classifier that can get, you can have arbitrarily high accuracy as long as you give it enough training data, right? So it's a little bit like in the realizable setup that if you just throw enough data, it will get arbitrarily good. And then a classic question is whether we can always construct such a strong learner from a weak learner, right? So we can use, I guess, a weak learner as a black box system to build a, a strong learner. And I'll try to, and I guess to, to look at this more carefully, we'll look at the concrete definition, the actual definitions here. So yeah. it may seem like this was only relevant in the agnostic case, but it's interesting in any case, right? I guess it is, yeah, as long as you have a, like a learning algorithm up here that's not guaranteed to find something that's... Just because um, even though you, the sample, or one reason is even though the sample complexity could be low, it might be much harder computational than the kind of strong. That's true, yeah, yeah, I guess it could also be that, yeah, it's, yeah you're right, that just if it's hard to compute something that does really well on the training data, yeah, you can still have something like this, that's a good point. I view this more as that, that kind of result. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so I guess the formal definition here with, of a weak learner is that uh, for any data distribution D, if I have enough examples, so here think of M zero as some constant, right? It doesn't. I guess there's no dependency on anything, right? We don't want anything to get arbitrarily good. So if I have enough training data, just more than some constant, then with constant probability, my learner is going to output something. Uh, that's a little bit better than guessing, right? In particular, it's advantage over guessing is at least the scanner, right? So it's its error under this distribution D is at most a half minus gamma. So that's a weak learner. And then an epsilon delta strong learner is one that says, okay, so if I have a target uh, error epsilon and the target success probability one minus delta, then there's some function of epsilon and delta, uh, M of epsilon and delta. If I have that many samples, then my epsilon delta strong learner with probability one minus delta over the 
uh, training data set will output a hypothesis whose errors at most epsilon on the D, right? So it's similar to this pack learning and realized case, right? So you can make it arbitrarily good as long as I have enough data. And I guess the error is again, just the chance of misprediction. Okay. So then the question is, uh, can we in general take such a gamma weak learner and turn it into an epsilon delta strong learner? And I guess the, adder is, uh, the answer is yes. And I guess the classic example of such an algorithm is add a boost by front and Sheffire. And there were also this, there were also previous algorithms that did this, but I guess it's the most famous one. And it produces a strong learner from a weak learner. I should take a weak learner as a black box and build from it a strong learner. Okay, so I'll just try to say what, what is Adaboost roughly doing? The basic idea is you take this weak learner and then you're going to run it multiple times. And each time you run it, you're going to take your training data set and you're going to put weights on it so that some points are more important than others. And each of these runs is going to output a hypothesis from, from H. And then you're going to compute a weight for each of them. And finally, you're going to combine all these hypotheses that you computed into like a weighted majority mode. Right? So each and every one of them uh, has an importance based on these output parameters, right? So some are more important than others. And of course, the, the technical details is how do you choose these weights in each iteration? And I guess the basic idea here is that you put large weights on things that you misclassify so far and small weights on those that are correct. So I'm trying to make the weak learner focus on classifying the misclassified points correct in, in each iteration. Right? And now, okay, how do you choose these weights? Somehow this depends on the accuracy of these hypotheses that you train. That's what Airbus does. It does some formula for computing the weights. Okay, so maybe let's just see just a short illustration of what it's doing. So let's say now my data is two-dimensional, the two features in my training examples, and let's say my classifier is a decision stump, so decision tree with one question in the root, right? So you can either ask a vertical split or a horizontal split and classify whatever you like on both sides of the split, right? So, so here, right, maybe this is your training data. And it's clear that there's no horizontal or vertical split that gets all of this correct, right? But if you try to run a boost, then in the first round, maybe you're going to compute this split here, right? It only gets those two points in the top uh, wrong. That's probably the best you can do with a, with a single split. And then what it's going to do is, I guess, it's going to put higher weights on those two that were misclassified and lower weights on the other ones. And then it's going to run again with these new weights on the points. And perhaps this time, it picks this bit here, right? And then we're only getting these three small points incorrect, but we're definitely getting those big blue points correct this time, right? So uh, this is maybe the best split you can compute with, with these weights. And so then you will, I guess, decrease the weight of everything you got correct and increase the weight of those that you got wrong. So maybe next time it looks something like this. And then you do one more round and probably this is the best split you can compute, right? Because now you have a really large weight on those red ones and those blue ones, and you get maybe the top red point incorrect and the two blue ones down there, the small ones. And then you train all these, and if you run out of boost, these are the coefficients that it would have computed. And finally, you, you look at this weighted majority vote, and you can, I guess you can try and see what does it predict in these different regions when you overlay these three uh, simple uh, decision stumps. So I guess here in the top corner, right, everything predicts blue, so here we're gonna output blue. Up here, right, uh, the first one predicts red, so it has this minus 0 0.69, but the other two outweigh it, so it's still a blue prediction in here, right? Over here, right, the first, let's see, the first two say red, and the last one say blue, so here there's a red majority, so it's gonna be red, and so forth, right? So you can just go through all of them. And you can see that it nicely gets all the labels correctly and, and creates this new kind of decision boundary that's not possible using just a single decision stump. So let's add a boost. And right, so it combines all these small learners into something that's better than any individual one. Okay, so the main question we look at, I guess now we finally got to it, is how many samples do you actually need to construct such a strong learner with given these parameters epsilon and delta, right? So how much, much training data is necessary? And it, I guess it's gonna depend on epsilon and delta, of course. It is also going to depend on the VC dimension of the hypothesis set that the weak learner is outputting from. And it's also going to depend on this advantage scanner over uh, random guess. That those are the parameters that, that will uh, be involved in, in this bound. Okay. So I guess we can start by trying to have a look at what is Adaboost, how well is Adaboost performing? Uh, how many samples does it need 
to turn into a weak learner into a strong learner. So I'm just going to give it like a sketch proof of how it's not a formal proof, but just the ideas in the analysis of Adaboost and how would you prove that Adaboost actually achieves this. So let's say H is this voting classifier, majority vote that is output by Adaboost. And then we can look at what is the property does it have, right? So this is a classic property of Adaboost. If I run it from uh, only one over gamma squared log m iterations, if I have m training samples, then it's going to classify all the training data correctly. Right? So this is a pretty non-trivial thing to prove, but it's Mind us gamma. gamma was the advantage over guessing for the, the weak learner. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of non-trivial thing to prove, but it lies in the way that it chooses these weights on the training data, right? So, so you can prove that. Yeah, one over gamma squared long m iterations, and then you get all the data correct. Okay, so this is a completely formally correct thing. The next thing is more like a hand wavy thing. So, like, look at this unknown target function, right? It's just for intuition on why it gets the same complexity that it does. So, the unknown target function, right? <clears throat> it's going to agree with whatever added boost outputs on all the training data. So, it's almost like in the realizable case, at least if you look at the, the training data part, right, they completely agree. So. So in some sense, you could say that the unknown target function almost lies in the set of all these voting classifiers that you can construct from just combining T hypothesis. Right? At least on the training data, there is something you can get from combining T uh, weak, uh, simple hypotheses to, to match F on the, on the training data. Right? So, so you know, it, it's almost the same as if it actually lies in this hypothesis. So. OK. So then you could say, okay, but what's the VC dimension of this hypothesis set where I'm allowed to combine T hypotheses? Right? Well, it is almost just T times larger than any individual hypothesis, the, the base hypothesis. Yeah. Another question. <clears throat> when you began with the definition of the weak learner, this is with respect to the distribution of inputs you began with. And uh, no, no, the important, that's actually very important. The definition of weak learner requires it for any distribution, yes. Okay. Yes, in particular for all the different weighings, those are the distributions that, that you're going to look at, yes. All the weighings that Adaboost is going to place on it. Yeah, that's actually important. Is it actually known that you can't, with polynomial sample complexity overhead, that you can't um, go, yeah, go from weak to strong for a fixed distribution? Or like, or, or is this out, is it, is it known that this algorithm can't work? Like, you just like, Run your learner on, on samples from the original. Oh, so you only so your weaker assumption on it that it only is. So we're like, here's an algorithm. You just like get some samples, polynomial, whatever many you need, to learn something. We do that polynomially many times with fresh samples, and then do some kind of majority answer. Is it known with that? It's a good question. I don't think it works, but I have to think offline to just. I don't think it works honestly. Uh, yeah, I think you can cook up some distribution that make it fail. Uh, but the weird thing is, no, no, uh, yeah. So maybe, this, maybe, maybe a simple example is, uh, maybe you have a data. Okay, if you don't require it for all distributions, I guess you could imagine having, like, have a data distribution where the, uh, like maybe, maybe this doesn't make sense. Okay, so that like in your input domain there are two points, like this this point over here has. On the distribution D, you have slight chance gamma of getting this one, or maybe you have a half minus gamma, and you have a half plus gamma chance of getting that point. And your hypothesis that only has one hypothesis that is wrong here, like and correct over here. And then this would be a weak learner if you only required it for the distribution D, right? That you just output that hypothesis, it's correct with half plus gamma, but no matter how many. All right, let's stick to the. Okay, that's so degenerate, but okay. Yeah, I don't know. It's the first thing I can come up with. And just to make sure there is some second order thing. Like <clears throat> all of the red points are in the left part of the plane, all of the blue points are, sorry, like 75% of the blue points are in the right side of the plane, then a quarter of the blue points will be in the wrong side. But then everything, like every first sample, will put the, the yeah, hypothesis in the middle. Yeah, it's not it's not convincing to me that I can explain that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, at least a degenerate example shows it's we probably need it for all, and it's very important, at least in the proof. Um, yeah, okay. So I, I guess in addition to Adaboost, there's also another like VM minimax 
phenomenon we can also prove it there and then it also requires all distributions so i think it's probably pretty central to yeah, i think you read i just don't yeah yeah um okay so right so so roughly the reason i mentioned grows by factor t i guess the easiest way to see it if you know this standard way of proving you can look at the growth number of this hypothesis at h. If you know what the growth number is, is the uh, largest number of distinct labels you can create on. It's a function that gives the largest number of distinct labels you can create on n samples. And if you combine t of them, it basically you raise it to the t-th power. And so, so this is roughly saying that the region image just grows by this factor t. Okay. So this means that, okay, it's almost like pack learning in the realizable case, right? Because if almost lies inside the set, and the set has almost has basically reached dimension t times d. So if you just believe all of this, and it can be made formal, right? You can make the proof formal, but these are at least intuition for why it's true. You can plug in this d prime in the sample complexity of pack learning in the realizable case, and you get a sample complexity for added boost. And if you plug that in, I guess if you get the one over gamma squared, uh, you get the original D, you get a log M. I mean, now we have M on both sides. It's inside a log. And I guess if you solve it, basically, right, you have the D, you have the one reps, and you have the one over gamma that needs to go in there. Without going into too many details, but that, that's basically what happens to this, this M here. So this is a, like the same complexity of added boost. It's not so pretty, but at least it's something, and it shows that you can, with enough samples, you will get arbitrarily high accuracy. And it depends on all these epsilon, uh, delta, gamma, and d. Okay. Yeah, so maybe you could, okay, so if you wanted to improve this analysis, maybe you could, you know, it suffice to run for fewer iterations. And I think all the people also look at it, but we had a paper at least in 19 that showed that in general, you cannot hope to reduce the number of iterations here if you want to get all the labels correct. This is basically the, the optimal number of iterations. And also, there was also a lower bound for the, like this pack learning in the realizable case that pretty much shows that this is the optimal sand complex, right? So there are a couple of barriers when trying to improve this analysis. And, and indeed, this is the best current bound for, for added boost, right? But maybe one could give a better analysis. It's, it's not clear. Okay, so that's it. This is the sand complexity of added boost. And so what, what we look at, or what we do in, in this work is we get rid of those two log factors. So it's at least a cleaner bound. And then we also show that this is the, the tight bound, right? You need this many samples for turning a weak learner into a strong learner. Okay. So I guess the right dependency is one over epsilon. This is D and the one over gamma squared. The log one over is the boring term that's just always there, but the other ones are the interesting ones. There's a small caveat. The lower bound proof does require that the V dimension is somewhat large compared to the margin gamma or the advantage gamma over guessing. And uh, there's actually a paper at stock 21 that hints at it. it's not actually a weak to strong learner, but it could hint that that it's possible to get a better dependency actually when D is uh, smaller than log or whatever. Basically, they show something like the, that you, you might get a dependency where you have this uh, gamma is raised to the 2D over D plus one. And, and exactly when our low bound stops working, this is when this becomes a non trivial exponent on, on, uh, on gamma. So there's some hope of doing something in, in that machine still. Okay, but, but otherwise, these are the results. And so I, I go, okay, this delta is always boring. So I'll just get rid of it for now, right? And everything I'm going to say is always with probability one minus delta over the sample, right? So, but I'll just get rid of it to not make all the formulas. So, so okay, so, so it's just D of epsilon gamma squared, and that's the tight dependency as well. Okay. So now I guess I'll try to explain what our algorithm has been doing. Uh, for, for weak to strong learning. The algorithm is actually quite simple. So, so here's the algorithm. So you get the training data set S, and then the main idea is that you're going to take this data set and you're going to create a, some subsets of it, some subsamples where you're going to ignore some of the data. Not three, but some number that will be clear in the next slide. So you're going to create these subsets of the data, and then you're going to run add a boost on each of one, every one of these subsets. Okay, so somehow you run add a boost on this data, on this data, and on that data, and each of those Produce this voting, classify this majority vote with weights on them, right? So we're gonna compute a uh, bunch of those, one for each of the subsets. And then we're gonna take all of those and combine them by taking another majority. So it's a majority of majorities, the, the final algorithm. Okay. And this one is not weighted, it's just a plain majority of the of this, of the ones of all these edibles that you're going to train. Okay. 
So that's the basic algorithm. Of course, the question is, right, so you get the samples, you generate some subsamples, you run add a boost on each one of them to compute these sporting classifiers, and then you take the majority of their predictions. That's the, that's the full algorithm. Of course, the question is, how do we generate these subsamples? And why does it help to generate these subsamples and combine these added boosts with majorities? Okay. So to try and talk about these subsamples, I guess I'm going to go back to pack learning in the realizable case. But uh, I'm just, so forget everything about our algorithm, just back to pack learning in the realizable case. For now. We'll, we'll uh, come back to it later. So this is where this unknown target function was actually in the hypothesis set. Okay. And so, right, and this was the classic result, ignoring the delta, right, that uh, when a distribution, you need this one or epsilon D log one or epsilon samples to guarantee that any hypothesis that gets all the labels correct on the training data also has error at most epsilon on the, on the D. Okay. And there was a matching lower bound for this, right? So you couldn't really do better if you want such a guarantee. But I think now the, the interesting thing is that you can actually get around the lower bound if you do the following. So, right, so you are promised that if this unknown type function lies in the hypothesis, that, that, that's the definition of the realizable case. But even though this unknown type function is actually a hyperplane in this example here, right, there's no one forcing you to actually output a hyperplane, right? Or maybe you, you, if you want that, then that's, I guess it's called proper learning if you actually have to output something from the hypothesis, and there you cannot do better. Okay. But you can actually do so that's for proper learning? Yeah, I guess proper learning is, yeah, if you have to. Yeah. The, the matching order. yes it's only for proper learning yes yeah so that's the, the twist yeah the lower bounds only if you for proper learning we actually output something that lies in the hypothesis set as well so you can actually get around the lower bound if you do something else it might be surprising at least to me that you know you know it's a linear model but you output something that's not a linear uh, model itself and, and that does better than any linear model you could output it's kind of interesting and so this is a result from 2016 by Haneke that says you can actually, with just one epsilon times D sample, so you get rid of this log one epsilon, you can output some hypothesis uh, whose error is the most epsilon. And everything is again with probability one minus delta, and the dependency in delta is the same as, as above. Okay. So this is interesting that, that this is possible. So let me uh, right, so save this log one epsilon, and actually there's a matching low bound for this one as well that says no matter what the algorithm is, uh, even a non proper algorithm, we need this many samples, right? So this is also optimal. Okay, so, so here's this algorithm. And so his algorithm is based on trading subsets. Right? So that's where our subsets come from. So, so what we do is, we, I guess you look at all the training data and just order them in some order. And then he has this recursive procedure for generating subsamples that uh, we're gonna look at here. So I guess it's a base case. And, and there's a recursive part here. It takes two argu arguments, S and T. And what you do to begin with is you invoke this method with the full training data set as the first argument and the empty set as the second argument. Okay, so then what does it do? And so we're not in this base case here, right? The training data set is still bigger than four. So we're in the recursive part. And so what we do is we partition the data into four sets of equal size, like up there. And then you're gonna make three recursive calls on this data here. So what you see here in all the three recursive calls, the new S is gonna be the first chunk up here, right, it's zero. So that's gonna be the same for all of them. And then the new T is gonna be the old T, but you add something to it. And what you can see here is in the first recursive part, you leave out as one. The second recursive part, you leave out as two. And the last one you leave out as three. So if you look at this recursive call here, right, we're leaving out as, as uh, one. So this is kind of gone. This is our new T and this is our new S in that recursive call. Okay, now we're gonna look again. Okay, we're still not in the base case. So we're gonna partition it again into four pieces. And then we're gonna again recurse and say, this is our new S. We're gonna leave out as one and then we're gonna add those two to the T that we already have, right? So now it looks like this. And now finally we're in the base case. So we just output is this S together with everything we have there, right? So, so this is going to produce one subsample uh, for the output. And of course, this was only one of the recursive calls, one of the paths down the recursion tree. Of course, there's all the other ones. So in general, this example of size 16, it's going to look like this. 
So I guess each of these chunks is one of the top three recursive calls, right? So you leave out either this chunk you leave out or this one or this one here, right? And then in the next one, they're gonna leave out either this one, this one, that one, and so forth. Right? So you're gonna produce all these subsets, right? And then if you think about it, it's not too hard to see this polynomial number of subsets, right? The size of the data goes down by factor four each time you make three recursive calls. So there's something like M to the log base four, three, many subsets at the end of it. Okay, so less than this and M. Right, there's nine here and M was 16. Okay, so you're gonna output all these subsets. And all right, so this is what Hennig is doing. And now what is his all right? So you leave out, I guess, one chunk for every recursive level. And so now his final pack learner that's optimal in this realizable case is doing the following. So you, you run this subsample procedure to generate all those subsamples. Then in every one of them, you're basically going to run empirical risk minimization. You're just going to pick some hypothesis in the base hypothesis set that gets all the labels correct on the subsample. Okay. So this computes all these HIs, and then you take a majority vote of those at the end of it. Right. So to so do majority over one that's trained on all of these subsets. So that's it. So in, in the linear model case, like you train a whole lot of linear models, and then you do a majority vote over their predictions. This is not a self a linear uh, model. Okay. Okay, so let me try to give you the idea and the analysis also to see uh, how it fits together with our work. So, so why does this help, right? And it's, uh, it's really a tricky argument, but it's, it's neat. So let's try to look at um, one of these recursive calls here. Right, so you make the first recursive call, right? It's gonna leave out this S1 here, right? So, which means that, okay, so this recursive call is gonna generate a whole lot of subsamples that you're gonna train hypotheses on each and every one of them using empirical risk minimization. But all these hypotheses that you're gonna train on everything that's being output in this recursive part, right, they're gonna be trained on something that leaves out as one. Right? So none of them will use as one for anything. Okay. Now, if you look at one of these other recursive calls, the important thing is that this one is gonna, everything that you train down here is gonna use all of this one, right? because you add it to T. So, so this, S1 is going to be included in this subsample and every single subsample down here, right? So they're all going to be trained on all of S1. And the same with this last recursive call, they're also, all of them, are going to contain all this data. What do you assume about each of the learnings? Why couldn't I? Everything I'm learning on is a subsample of the original data, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So what prevents me from just finding one thing that fits all of the original data and answering it is- no, But you're only, I mean, the important thing is that this learning algorithm that you're running at the bottom, it only gets to look at the subsample. I understand, but what do you assume about it that prevents it from just- uh, um, That it is independent, okay, that, it, that its output is independent of the things it doesn't see. Let's see only a sub. The thing it computes does not depend on the stuff it doesn't see, right? So it's a, it, you can say it's a, it's a function only of the input to it. Like if it gets a set of samples, it has to output a hypothesis. It's, it doesn't know what you didn't give it. I guess that's the only thing that makes sense. So you just give it a set of samples and it just outputs something that's, that matches all of it. Like some, it's, it doesn't even have to be deterministic. You can think of it of a deterministic algorithm. It just looks at the data it gets and outputs something. Okay. Yeah, but the, the important point is that these ones were not used for training on that. I guess it'll become clear now, at least maybe in a second, what it is that we're using here. So let's look at this one again. All right, so what's the crucial point here? What's the idea? So like, look, look at all the ones we have down here and try to look at the majority of all these. Like the, if you took a majority vote only on the ones that are, that are coming from this recursive call. Like, so, so let's assume for now that this majority has a large chance of making a misprediction. We're looking at... Oh, only this one third of all of them. Like if I look at the majority of these, one third of all the, uh, all the hypotheses. Make sense? I'm just wondering, okay, so I'm looking at how it's doing on S1, S2, S3, S4. Yes, okay, so let's see. So this recursive call trains some hypotheses. Hypotheses, uh, look at the majority vote and look under the data distribution D, what is the chance that they make, under D, yeah, what's the chance to make a misprediction under D? Okay. Let's assume that that was a large probability, that they had a rather large chance of making a misprediction. I guess you're going to assume that that means that it's also <coughs> bad on its 
Uh, no, I'm going to show. Okay, so let me try to maybe it's just say it here. So let's assume they make a large, they have a large chance of making this prediction. And then because this set here was left out, right, these are IIDs samples from D, even if I condition on everything else, which means just by concentration, you would also see many places here where this majority is wrong, right? Because it's like a test set, right? So the performance in here should be very close to the the outer center, the error on the D, right? Because these are IID samples. So if there's a big chance of making a mistake here, you're going to see a lot of mistakes in there. Okay. So okay. So these are the lightning bolts here. These are the places where the majority of of these one third of the hypothesis that's where they err. Okay. Now let's try to. Okay, so what are the, if I just tell you these are the samples where you err, but I don't tell you anything else, then the distribution of these samples are still IID, but they are from the conditional distribution where I tell you that this majority errors. So this is a little tricky. So I'm just telling you, before I tell you anything, all of these are IID samples from D. Now I'm telling you these positions where there are lightning bolts, this is where you make a mistake. And you're just telling me the ones that you make a mistake with respect to what training did? Uh, this, the, the thing that this outputs, right? So condition everything outside. Now I have some, some set of hypotheses here. And I'm going to say, I'm just going to indicate where do... Where, within S1. What? You're just telling me within S1 which ones things. Yes. So, yeah. So just telling me which ones that, that are wrong. You're misclassified. In S1. Only in S1, yes. So now they're just IID samples from the conditions distribution where I tell you that they make a mistake. Okay. Now let's look at the other two here, right? So they all included all of S1. One of them left out is two, one of them left out is three. But the important point is that all the ones that you train here include all of S1, right? Which means since we're in the realizable case, right? The, all these hypotheses, we ran empirical risk minimization. So we're going to get all these labels correct. Right? That's by, because we find something that gets all the labels correct. So in particular, they're going to get all the lightning bolts correct. Right, so they're going to be correct with the first one third errors, the majority of the first one third errors. Right? So they're, they're going to get these correct. Okay. But these were, these lightning bolts were IID samples uh, from where the first one third make an error. Okay. You're assuming that the empirical risk minimizer did, did fine without many samples, but you're trying to something. Yeah, so I guess the important, okay, so let's do here. The important point is here that maybe if you go back to this realizable case, the theorem here doesn't talk about just the output of running empirical risk minimization. It's not like the execution of the algorithm. It says every single hypothesis in the hypothesis that gets everything correct has a small error on the D, right? So here it doesn't depend on which one I chose to output as long as I did anything that was the output of empirical risk minimization. It's going to have a small error under, under this distribution D. Does this make sense? I'm trying to get rid of, you're trying to get rid of the log one around this one, right? Yeah. Um, so you can't assume this because you didn't get it that many samples. Um, okay, so I guess I'm seeing the, the whole analysis, right? I guess you start at the bottom of this recursion tree and then you go all the way up. And then you, each time you're gonna, okay, so there's a, a lot more to the analysis, but you're gonna show that in an inductive step that the errors get smaller and smaller as so you get higher and higher out the, the tree. And the only thing that really suffices for, for this step that you're doing now is that you have enough samples that the error probability is one over 200. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I'll, I'll show you in the next slide actually what our key, yeah, okay. I'll go actually back to my previous question because I still don't fully understand this. So far, the way you, you defined this type of learning is that just I have my data set with its labels and I'm taking any hypothesis for my hypothesis class that fits all of this uh, data and its labels. And here you need to somehow use the fact that I don't have the rest of the data. How do I use that? Like, where does it come? Well, the, I guess the, the output has to be completely determined from all of this. I think that's the only property you're using because if you had some. That somehow used this, it was not. It should just be completely defined from what you see here, right? That's the only requirement. Just reading an algorithm that's not allowed to sample all from these, just given these, 
Um, but my, my problem is that uh, our learning algorithm is pick an arbitrary hypothesis. Yeah. yeah, but it's, it's still, I guess the point is, it still doesn't know what S1 is. So these are still IID sent from D. And I guess that's the only thing that we use, the independent of whatever it chose to output. Like that's the main idea. Okay. okay. So what we do now, I guess, here is that this D, this is for any distribution D. So in particular, I'm going to plug in that distribution over there, right? The one where I tell you, because I know up here, I see a lot of samples from this distribution over here. And I know that I'm correct on all of them, right? Because it was uh, in the realizable case. So I know I'm correct on all of them. Which means that all these hypotheses that I'm going to train in all these recursive calls, they're all going to have a small error under this distribution. So what, what does that mean, right? What does it give us? It basically means that when, when the majority of the first one third of these hypotheses error, the remaining two thirds are correct, at least on this training data here, but also, I guess if you draw a new sample, for example, you could draw a sample with the first one third error, with high probability, the last two thirds are gonna be correct. Actually, right? so anyway, you're just looking at the majority of all of them. So two thirds that are correct versus one third that are wrong is gonna, they are off, right? like ideas of boosting in it. Like yeah, in some sense you could, yeah. Yeah, yeah I guess there yeah, are these simpler versions of boosting where you correct on each other's mistakes. Yeah, that's kind of that's right. Okay, so that's the base, basic intuition here. Um, and I guess what Henning is showing that it's enough to plug in this bound for all these condition distributions. And the final thing is only going to have error DOFs and by some recursion, you do some uh, inductive argument of the recursion tree and show that it gets better, better towards the total. The tree. Okay. Okay. So now, so how do we, what do we do? So one of them is that we look at this analysis again and, and observe. One thing is, that, and basically what we see is that it's enough for the argument that these um, hypotheses that you train on the mistakes of the other ones, the uh, error under this condition distribution should just be one over two hundred. That's that's enough, right? So you just need to have it, you just need to see enough lightning bolts. That the error drops one over 200 on this condition distribution. So, so you don't really need this whole general formula that goes down uh, uh, to arbitrary small epsilon. You just need it to go below one over 200. Okay. And so, and then basically what we show is that you can just, if you just run Hennig's construction, you guess the, the final number of samples you need for this to overall majority to have an error of the most epsilon is one over epsilon times number of samples that the base learner uh, needs to get error of one over 200. So it's a, <laughs> and okay, the important point is here, like the other one was one or epsilon D log one or epsilon. <laughs> that was the performance on, in, for pack learning in the realizable case. One or epsilon D log one or epsilon. If you plug in one over 200, all the epsilons go away and it just says D, right? So is that true? Like what? It was one over epsilon, or I guess D log one over epsilon, right? was the number of samples. But if you plug in a constant epsilon, it doesn't matter that there's log one over epsilon, it just goes away. Right? I guess that's the main point. Okay. Right, so <clears throat> number of samples to get error less than epsilon. Right, so, so I guess all we need to understand is how many samples do we need to go below an error of, say, one over 200, some other constant, right? But one over 200 is what we show in our work. Okay, so now, okay, so our algorithm now, the full algorithm is the way we generate the subsamples is like chemical us, right? We do exactly the same subsamples. And, and that's the full algorithm. And basically by that argument, we just show by just repeating his argument, the number of samples we need for our algorithm is one over epsilon times the number of sample edibles needs to get down to one over 200 error. It's basically just by plugging in what, what he did. Is there a condition on the, uh, before you said there was a condition? I think it was on delta. Oh, with, with the delta is also part of it. Um, yeah, it's the number of, it's still the, the number of, like what you get here is just the number of samples such that with probability one minus delta, your error is down to one over 200. Uh, if you want the delta dependency as well, yeah. Um, but that is still just uh, additive log one over delta. And let you get there. Yes, that's also tied on in terms of delta. Okay, so right, so we just need to understand how many samples does Edibu need. Edibu need to get down to error one or two hundred. 
And we already have this bound here, right? This was the one we kind of hand waved in the beginning uh, that, you, that is the best known for Ada boost. If we plug in one over 200, I guess all the epsilons go away, right? And it's the important thing is that like one of the logs at least disappears, right? The other one is still there. And if we plug that in to this thing up here, we multiply the whole thing with the one over epsilon, and as we're almost there, at least we shape one log vector compared to Eddie boost, but we're not quite done yet. Right? So we got most of the way. So we got rid of one log. So we just need to get rid of the last one. And for this, the last part of our, of our paper is actually not an algorithm, it's just a better analysis of Eddie boost if you're only looking at the case of 200 error or constant error. Okay, and this is actually quite non-trivial, right? So this is the previous bound for Ada boost. Getting rid of that log is, I think, actually the technically most challenging part. Uh, so what we are aiming at showing is just that Ada boost only needs d over uh, gamma squared samples to get error one over two hundred. Okay. So if we plug that in, then we're done. If we just take this this improved sample complex for Ada boost. Okay. So I'm not going to show it here. It won't take too long. Uh, so I'll just show what are the ingredients of the proof in particular, I guess, if you know the tools and learning theory, maybe you get something out of it. Otherwise, I hope you got something out of the first part. But uh, the, the first step is that we have, we have these arbitrary voting classifiers that add boost can produce. And we're going to simplify them somewhat. We're going to approximate all of them. So if you're only aiming for understanding error 1 over 200, we can approximate them by other uh, voting classifiers that have like the, the difference in the errors, like 1 over 1,000. So we're going to kind of approximate them by such G prime. These G prime are going to have some nice properties. Like, so one property is that they are only going to combine one over gamma squared, same hypothesis in one, instead of one over gamma squ uh, squared log. And, okay. and then here we crucially use again that it's only constant error. And, uh, so that's important in this step. I think maybe an interesting and surprising fact that we also prove or use is this one here. So. So what is this saying? It's saying in these G primes that we look at, if you look at what it's going to output, right, so it, it takes, it, it combines T predictions. If you're going to average them, then this is, you know, this is called the margin of a voting classifier, right? So it's basically going to be a number between minus one and, and one. Right? So if they all agree, it'll be like close to it'll be either one or minus one. If they, half of them say plus one, half of them say minus one, it's going to be zero. And so what we're going to show is that these G prime have the property that these margins are always very far away from zero. Okay, so somehow they're the large margins. Okay, so that's one thing as well. And there's again, like, because we can afford some constant error, we have some one over a thousand there. So basically these G prime make, don't, they, it's rare that they make predictions of small absolute value before you take the sign. Somehow, some anti concentration results shows up in this one. It's the, the basic point is, I, I guess you can think of it like this. How are we doing on time? Ah, maybe I should just wrap up instead. Yeah. Um, the, the basic idea is that if you take one of those um, voting classifiers that Adaboost would produce, right? So it would be like some over L fry HI is if you normalize everything to make this a probability distribution, and so you just normalize the sums one and then non-negative, then the basic idea now proof is to sample from, think of this as a distribution and then the sample hypothesis according to this distribution. And the expectation is gonna give, make the same predictions. And also this is where this offer, it would offer lemma comes in. These random samples, it's gonna be unlikely that they're gonna end up close to zero if you send these many times. And also all the predictions are gonna be pretty close to what they were before. If I sample one over gamma squared many times, they're gonna deviate by some small gamma from the original predictions. What we're gonna show is that at a boost will have margins that are significantly bigger than gamma, so which means that we preserve all the predictions are gonna be the same. Those are the kind of basic ideas there. All right, so, okay, so those are the kind of ingredients. And then if you know the classic proof of this uh, generalization for things with bound of easy dimension, you do this trick of sampling a ghost data set, like a, have two data sets of uh, size M 
well, one of them is just for the sake of analysis. And then you show that the growth number of G prime, these G primes for these properties uh, this has a small growth number, then you can finish the last step. And here, for proving this, somehow we use this Weidemann complexity argument. Uh, and this property is really crucial there that uh, in bounding the Weidemann complexity. But, but that's the kind of ingredients that go into the proof, at least. Okay. Yeah. This really uses this, this part a lot. Maybe if you know the, the trick, I guess the, the, the obstacle we're trying to overcome, if you think of this ghost data sets, if you remember, do you all know the, the, this idea? Oh, okay, then let me not go into it. Just, uh, it's too technical then. Okay, but these are the, the kind of uh, ingredients. Is that before that um, data boost produces stuff with large margin? Uh, okay, so, so yeah, okay, so, so technically I'm cheating a little bit. We're actually not plugging in edible food, uh, plugging in one that's called edible is new which has a very small tweak to it, and then it outputs hypothesis like this. Actually, we also showed originally, before we realized it was already known, if you take added boost and just remove, if you, instead of putting a weight, it computes a weight on each hypothesis on some, uh, based on some probability of how well it does in, in the classification. If you just put the same weight on everyone, it does produce margins at all, at least some constant factor of, of the advantage. So that you can you can yeah if you just go through the proof you'll see that this is the case so that it actually does get large margins. So so I'm cheating a little bit. Everyone knows Edibus. So I didn't want to say Edibus new, but it, it's basically that. Okay, so so all right. So those are the ingredients. Um, so we get this new same complexity, and this is basically tight. I guess there's not too much to, not enough time to talk about the lower bound, but it's fairly simple information theoretic lower bound. And it requires this, uh, assumption on D. Yeah. Um, what else to say? Yeah. Um, you, they might be able to do something in this regime of small D. I think is an interesting open problem. Yeah, where did this come from? This is a low bound. The, the low bound requires this. Yeah. yeah. So we don't know whether the other is tied in the, in the smaller regime. Uh, and probably it's not. I guess that you could do something. At least for algorithms that are not computationally bounded, maybe you can use their result to do something. That's not clear. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a couple of interesting follow up questions. We've already addressed some of them. Uh, one of them is, and I think many, it's a nice question. Like currently, there's an analysis of Adaboost, right, that has some two log facts too much, but you know, maybe it's just a poor analysis, right? Maybe Adaboost actually works, gives the same. So we are we are we have written something out where we're proving that actually Adaboost has at least one of the log factors, so it's not optimal. I guess that that's one, uh, but it's, it has not yet been ruled out whether you could actually just have a simple voting class where we have this majority of majorities. It's not clear that it's not. Maybe you can do just a classic single level of majority and, and make it work. I think that's an interesting question. We've not been able to rule that out at least. Yeah, we tried to, but there are some reasons for why maybe you can actually still make it work. It's just a simple majority. Um, yeah, and then I think something I. Okay, so, so actually, if you replace and I was just with your subsample and majority, take the majority over that, what did you achieve? If we, oh, say again, if you say take add a boost. Basically, you just don't use add a boost, you just use your subsamples and take the. Uh, oh, but you need it to, yeah, okay, so in our, we, we definitely need that. Each and every one that we train on the subsamples is actually correct on all of it. That's a crucial part of it. So we need to do add a boost and make we're crucially using that we'll get all these margins of the least gamma. So we can kind of use the same as in the in his in his argument where you get everything correct also on the place where the other ones are wrong. That's still the main idea in ours. So so we're using add a boost to get all of them correct with large margins. And then yeah, then we can, we can call this. Uh, yeah, I think another result is can you simplify Hennig's construction, which is something I, I looked at and I guess it will be online tomorrow on archive. But you can actually do something simpler than his way of constructing these overlapping subsets. You can just use what's called bootstrap aggregation or bagging, which is sample random subsets of the training data, just samples uh, without replacement from, uh, with replacement, sorry, yeah, from the data set. You know, that, that also works, um, but requires a much, much more work. And it actually also works in his pack learning in a realizable case. You can substitute his. Uh, careful construction of overlapping things with, with random subsamples. Then you only need, instead of this one, creates this polynomial manual subsamples, it only needs a logarithmic number 
of these subsamples groups to, to do it. Right. Okay. Then I guess my postdoc created this nice figure. So I think I'd just use it there with fishing set fish. Oh, but that's, that's all. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me here.